No, don't encourage this, you yeah, guys. Please, guys, please. Dun, no, this, this, dun, you guys dun, are the problem. Dun, dun, all right, dun, you're giving dun, him the ego. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to a very special episode of the Unwax Podcast. With your favorite sisters, Sophia and Sistine Stallone. You guys, we did it. Round of applause. Episode 50. 50. Thank you. Thank you so studio. much. The studio's clapping. Yes, yes thank you yes, so much. Yes. It's been a journey. It and has I, been. I don't think we expected to make it to episode 50. No, we did not. I feel like we see ourselves a year ago from today, and it was just not the same. I think it was us hauling our ring lights in. It was embarrassing everything. to it say the least, but the we same. really wanted to make this episode extra special for you guys. That's why we thought we must bring in a guest that has never one done a podcast before. Never. Is honestly the hardest guest that we've ever had to catch, quite literally. Yeah, the sea mm -hmm. is pretty big. It, it took a lot of man. You guys, we went fishing for two weeks yeah. to reel this guest in. Well, maybe you had some holes in your net. Did you ever think of that? Perhaps we did. Why don't we introduce you yep. right now? Because clearly you want to jump into the show already. We okay. have doing his first podcast interview ever. Ever. The iconic King, King Shark. Shark. Ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. I like to be known as the Podfather from here on in. No. Yeah, uh, Podfather no, one. What was the Pod thing Father we were two. talking about for you to say? Do a line from Do King a line. Shark. Also, put oh. your mic in front of your mouse. And thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now I worked a long time on that. It just doesn't come naturally. Dad, you grab your mic classes. and put it to your mouth. Please. Okay, I guess that was a straight. And okay. Okay. See, I guess that was a straight giveaway. Dad, welcome to the show. Thank you. Obviously, you were probably the number one requested guest that we've had ever. That's not true. It, it is, and really? honestly, we I'm wanted to flattered. wait. We really were. Mm -hmm. I think we're very nervous and very excited because we just want to make sure that, you know, our podcast, are you okay? You're adjusting. Okay. Love you it. guys were expecting Say an that episode. To my face. Uh, come on. You guys were probably expecting something a bit more structured than this. This uh, is going to be the most chaotic seriously. episode you're ever going to see. What is see. this, a weather vane? Like, oh, you don't need a weather man to know which way the wind blows. Here it is, folks. <laughs> and okay. he does stand up. We wanted to make sure that before we had you come on because... You know, we want to make you proud. We wanted to make sure this episode, this podcast, everything was just perfect. And, and legitimate. And legitimate. And I mm. think, you know, new studio, new couch, it seems pretty legitimate. Mm -hmm. Very so, legitimate. thanks for coming on today. Well, you're more than welcome. I, mean, I think people are now starting to realize that you are a secret comedian. No, I'm not. I just think that life belongs to those who can somehow make a sick joke out of it all because it does it works out if you take life too seriously what is that old saying to those who think life is a comedy those who feel life is a tragedy so i just try to keep it light and lively well that's something yeah. that you've always done and that's a side to you that i don't think a lot of people no, know not not at all. and that's why we think this episode would be a great opportunity to ask you questions that maybe might be inappropriate for other interviewers to possibly okay. ask you, but we can get away with because it. Because we're your daughters. Because we're your kids. Fair so, enough. Ask those questions. Okay. Ask those difficult ones. I mean, yeah, let's just get into, should we start when you were just a wee little boy? A wee little boy? Yeah. All absolutely. right. Let's okay. go into your childhood because you have quite the interesting childhood. Yeah. Oh, if you yeah. could describe yourself in three words growing up, what would it be? Seriously? Yeah. Okay. Um... Loner, mm -hmm. uh, very uh, expressive, really loud, right. outgoing, and without a doubt, um, hmm, I'd say I got along very well com conversing. Yeah. It but it's fun. almost because from what you've told us growing up that you really just had to fend for yourself. You were you're kind of like a feral well, yeah. street kid. No, really. Well, I mean, your parents dropped well, I had you off. Very strange. My my parents weren't exactly brought up yeah. like stellar human beings either. The craziest story, I think one of them was the fact that you t I mean, this is kind of, I don't know if anyone knows this, but your parents dropped you off at like an old folks home when you were younger. <laughs> for the first and five years. For the first of five years of your life. Mom, my hands like raising house. you. Yeah. No, you were left but in an elderly home. So you were around as a five year old, 95 year olds. <laughs> so maybe so that's exactly... why you were figuring out how to converse with people very quickly because you were able to have these conversations. Yeah, my average friends were like 90. Yeah, like which is crazy. Like, so you're about five years old. Yeah, at the time, I didn't think it was so bad, but we look back on it. It's not exactly a smart choice. 
daycare centers. You have daycare centers today. Back then, they really didn't have. They had uh, boarding houses. Really? Yeah, for like traveling salesmen or airline stewardesses, people coming in and out. So you go down to a boarding table, mm -hmm. boarding house. Yeah. And you'd see 11 strangers. And the next day, there's nine strangers. It's a boarding house, literally like wow, so, low rent. Yeah. You know, you, you got some guy who smells like turkey. Well, that's in the of, next room. You go, yo, can't wait till he moves on and get that <laughs> guy who smelled like crab back in here. He was <laughs> oh great. Oh my nice. God. I mean, that probably makes sense for why you like jello so much today. Is that's probably I, all you were eating in the old I do. Home. I like food that doesn't require, it require chewing. any intelligence whatsoever. Rice pudding and jello. Exactly. And right. applesauce. Well, right. applesauce. You know, so since five years old, you're left with strangers. You told us countless times the amounts that you've ran away from home. A I lot, remember a lot. I remember one time actually, I don't know if you remember this. We were in Philadelphia maybe yeah. four years ago together. It was just you and me. And we were just walking through the streets and you were we were getting nostalgic and you were telling me all these stories. And you stopped me on the street corner and you said, Right here, I was 13 years old when I ran away from home. And I lit my first cigarette on this corner right here in Philadelphia. Get out of here. I swear. I and I said, yeah. I don't know why I thought that was the coolest story ever. My dad smoking a cigarette at 13, but you were really nostalgic about it. And I think that's. It, isn't it funny how certain things that get burnt into your memory, like yeah. certain things that are just apocalyptic in your life? Oh, my first cigarette, which I remember very well. It was a parliament, not, it was a parliament new filter types like whoa you know, <laughs> so you get to die a little bit later you know that kind of thing before oh, then <laughs> cigarettes were not considered bad they're considered very cool right mm -hmm. so everyone by the time they were 12 or 13 had some pack rolled up in their shoulder yeah, it was this, trendy it was yeah cool right. back it, then. it was terrible so was terrible. i mean how many times did you run away from home oh my god literally uh at least a dozen or more but it was never planned. For example, this is what's so different, why I would hate to have raised myself. I could have <laughs> never done it. I would put myself up for adoption. But I don't blame you. I mean, I would No, seriously, I, I believe it. I'm so. no picnic. I had this uh, attention disorder kind of a thing. I just didn't focus on anything. So anything that would become routine or boring, I would leave. So I'd be on, on my way to school, 16 years old. Mm -hmm. I go, God. I'm going to go to Florida. I'm going to go to Florida. And literally start and hitchhiking to Florida, wow. starting at Roosevelt Boulevard in Philadelphia. No money. Oh in other words, God. whatever I had for lunch and a coat, which I had ended up selling <laughs> outside of a swamp in Ocala, Florida for three bucks, which I remember that was my, that saved me. That three bucks was really important. But yeah, that's what I would do. And then you get to the bottom, you get to Florida, and I go, okay, now what? I yeah, have to get, get arrested or something because I have to get back to Philadelphia. No one's going to no volunteer. No what you sure. did. You'd purposely get arrested so, and then they'd send you home. What type of right. thing Because you were a minor. Right. What would you do that's to get arrested? That's so clever. Thank you. <laughs> what would you do I to get arrested? Well, what the happened right was say, the, the but... dumbest thing was, it, this, goes, this doesn't bode well for our military either. So I'm in Ocala, Florida, mm -hmm. alone. And I just sold my cup for three bucks. And I said, I got, okay, I'll have enough for a meal, but I got to get back to Philadelphia. And I see a military base. And I break onto the military base. What? But it's so simple. It's like, I really, literally. How is that simple? Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a fence. It's like, not like complicated. It wasn't like, oh, but sirens, and did guys it? with machine guns. It's like oh, a fence. Oh, my gosh. That's like it? you expect a guy with a lawnmower behind it going, eh, come on in. Yeah. <laughs> so I went in. Yeah. Place is deserted. It's maybe 10 o'clock at night. Then there's a thing called the PX, which is where it's, it's kind of like a place you go to eat. Yeah. PX by cigarettes. I went, I go in there. Of course, everything's locked up except oatmeal. oatmeal. This is why I have such oatmeal. an affinity for oatmeal. <laughs> <laughs> Any soft food. Well, the thing is, you never, ever, Put oatmeal in your mouth dry. Oh. You guys heard it here first on the Unwaxed podcast. Make sure you do not eat dry oatmeal. Ever. Who eats dry oatmeal? Well, what is that? Well, why are you giving uh, this a warning? That's a weird thing but to why do. But why would you want to do it? I was hungry. I said, okay, look at oatmeal. That sounds great. Quaker Oaks guy on the box. No problem. How in your dangerous mouth? can it be, huh? He, he looks friendly enough. It in your mouth? Yeah, just like that. And by the time I brought it back, 
Oh, God. Oh, no. It was so jammed up. It was so dry. No, it became like sponges. I started choking to death. So, so you're you choking s- on a oatmeal, oatmeal packet in a military base. In a military base in Ocala, Florida. Right. Left, and they came in. And I oh, go, thank cool. God. And for did they coffee. arrest you and thank save you? Thank God for oatmeal. Thank they God. arrested you and saved you. Yes, they did. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I okay, so can't even. you were quite the menace as a kid. Yeah. Such a menace that you tell us countless stories of how you were kicked out of, of 13 schools. schools. Was it 13 or 14 schools? 13. 13 schools. They would have made 14, but they ran out of schools. So, but they weren't regular schools, obviously. No, well, they were what happened? Military happens, you, schools, schools for trouble. Yeah, kids. you have to work your way through. Again, in all fairness to myself, <laughs> okay. I wasn't raised in a, in a right way. In other words, mm-hmm. my brain. Has always been flipped sideways. It's mm-hmm. just the way I've, I've interpreted life. That's why now I realize I made the right choice. But back then, you were a menace. Mm-hmm. Right. You were going nowhere. You were what is known as a juvenile delinquent, JD. He puts that in quotes. That's what, <laughs> I was a delinquent. Yeah, that's right. You were a JD. <laughs> so that's when I realized earlier on, after they kept sending me to school after school after school, they go, he just doesn't fit in. I go, guys, it's like the seventh school. Right. Where do I fit in? He goes, I don't know. Then we tried it again, and they said, he just doesn't fit in, and we're not going to allow him back. He's such a disruptive force. We won't let him back into the state of Pennsylvania. What, what? did you oh, yeah. do to so, did not? Yeah. So, and Maryland, it was banned from the entire Maryland school board. What? Montgomery Hills. But Dad, it's not, well. it's it's not you just military? having ADD in class to get that. That well, is pretty all, bad. No, I was I was adventurous. Do you remember the story you told me about you going to military school and stealing knives from yeah. your, what, what would you call your captains or your? Officers. Officers. Mm-hmm. So was that the factor that caused you to not even be able to well, go to school? I said, how it, do I get at, th- now I'm in a school where everyone's, very physical. Yeah. They all look like they're grown men with their full beards. I mean, they're like 16, 17 years old, but they're, they've been there. And this is the place to get you in order. But You're right. So they took these kids there from the time they were eight, and they'd be there until they're 18. So when they came out at 18, they were tough. Wow. I oh mean, God. tough. There was no love loss. This is when you had corporal punishment. You take a kid in the back room and just smack the hell out of them. That's, wow. that's so- what it was. At this point, this school is for troubled kids yeah. that need behavioral. It's for kids you yeah. don't want. Well, this right. is this yeah. isn't, this isn't like, military. Wait, is this like, Deborah like, what's, or military? It's kid, Deborah. born no, no, accidents. No, are, you ta- are you talking about the military school or Devereaux? No, military school. It's military school. You're still at military school here? Yeah. And this is the craziest part. Is I haven't not even in the, the troubled school yet. yet. Oh, the no. The fact that but anyway, it's, you know this. all this stuff is happening. These kids are getting hit and they're getting corporal punishment, but you still find the need to steal stuff. Yeah. And so you get that same punishment knowing that that could happen. That's why I think it's some, it's just, yes. I think there's something to be said about a certain mentality that when you're told not to, right away you say, ah, that's for normal people. I can pull this one off. Yeah. I can do it. It's like a stupid dare. Like, oh, what are you, chicken? They jump off a building. Now nah, I'll try well, it. No, you're just stupid. That seems well, really... no, but that's that's human behavior. You tell exactly a kid, right. You're not yeah. allowed to go out. They're going to sneak out. That's my point. So I had that overdeveloped sense of competition. Mm. If you say no, that's, that's well. That try definitely it. plays into your character today. I think a lot. Oh yeah. Of just when you say no, you mean yes, no, and that I... still plays every conversation, every so fight we have. After definitely... you know what I think is so interesting too, just like you have that cigarette story. You keep um, your report card from high school as well, and you show you show it all the time. You have it. I use it as an example. Later. Why do you use it as an example? Because it shows that you can fail every class. Yeah. And still end up pretty good. Right. So, but you didn't fail every class. Every class. No, Except you didn't fail art class. Well, art. Yeah, but that that's, that's you're an artiste. It makes sense. It, well, in Full a circle. sense. If you saw the picture, it was a horse with flies going around his head. It wasn't exactly. Matisse. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie. We do have one of your sketches framed from when you were 15. Yeah. And I go up to mom. I'm like, why is this up? Like, just because you know a kid paints it doesn't mean. It's, I mean, I'm, I'm not gonna insult your work. It's good. You are insulting his it's work. It's good, but you know, it's it was it was just like a. Oh, you kid passed sketching. insult about 15 minutes ago. <laughs> well, now no. we're into now we're into like yes. No, you know. No, I think can I ex- actually? Do you have all my photos? Now we're bordering on a lawsuit. For, okay. Yeah. 
for right deprivation of character here. Oh, oh. I mean, the knot should be issued every single day between all three of us. Okay. Because we are. <laughs> <laughs> I think the craziest uh, schooling you had, which is we had this discussion for a really long time that we wanted to make this into a TV show, like a horror show, was your time at Devereaux. And mm. this is a school, if anyone knows what it is, it's in Massachusetts or mm. was. I don't know if it's still around. And it's a school for troubled kids, like mm -hmm. behavioral issues. And well, I think I, that was like the final straw for every schooling that was That was it. Dealing that with was like, it. Well, that's military. the yeah. end. I can't believe you're bringing that up. You know, it's a very... Well, we don't have to get into it that deep. We don't, but, but I just find no, the stories No, it's nothing there perverse. Crazy. It's just a school where you never go home. Right. right. So give listeners maybe context how, how this would be different from a okay, general public school. Okay, they take you school. at a certain... You know, they test you and some some people are sent there by the state but you have to have a certain pension iq for something mm -hmm. you can't just be a horrible human being you have to have like some shining grace something right. and i don't know they found it in art but that school was so strict and so difficult that anytime you had a problem you're dealing with another 25 kids in your class every one of them had severe like violent problems or they came from home where they had seriously is serious issues uh between their parents and them just odd and when you would become truant now you live there but if you were late for class isn't that or you're you're flirting with a girl they would take you to a place called well, it was called Byberry at one time. Then oh, it yeah, turns I've seen that. No, but it's called Park Lodge. And Park Lodge was a building where they would send lifers to. And a lifer is a person that never gets out. It ever. was an insane asylum. Yeah, pretty much. An insane asylum. It's an insane asylum. And I'm going, what am I doing in an insane asylum? All I was doing was talking to a couple of kids. But they would but use it. you were that. sent to the insane asylum? Yeah. From how old to punish here? you? Yeah. Well, how old were you? Here? 16. So right. you were flirting with girls at this behavioral school, and to yeah. punish the students, they would like have them go as a retreat. One week, two science. weeks, three weeks. No way. Into Whoa. a padded cell, yeah. That's so wrong. Oh, it's so wrong. It, it, until you've been there and you're with people that are in that situation for life. Again, girls, this is in the 60s, and the world is a different place. There was a whole right. different place. Back then, corporal punishment was normal. In other words, the guys would walk around there with all the fellows that were lifers, and a lot of them couldn't talk. If you ever saw the film Cuckoo's Nest, yeah, that's a joke. Very nice movie, right? But it's a almost a fun place. Mm -hmm. It's not fun. So the point being, I would go through that, and you come back into the normal school system, mm -hmm. and supposedly you learn something, not really that much. Then I realized that people's human nature is pretty well set up at an early age. And as long as you're not innately cruel or doing things that are incredibly vindictive to individuals, I never saw myself as anything other than, you know, misunderstood, used right. like everyone else feels, and looking for my place in the world. So I was never what you call like an incorrigible, horrible human no. being that was looking to rob or steal or right. hurt. Mm -hmm. I was looking at anything, just mischief. Yeah, you were. To get anything to get out of, anything to get out of schooling. Right, right. You know, and so, yeah, and that's what you did. And I want to touch on the fact that you said you just did what you could to survive because I feel like that's been your entire life's journey Completely, so far. Yeah. So you make it out of Devro. Yeah. You're now a young adult, and I would love to sort of get into your early career because you have probably the most abnormal resume I have ever heard in my life. I mean, just to <laughs> name a few, you were a lion cage cleaner, yeah, right? A bouncer. You cut fish. You were an usher. Good of fish books. cutter. I want to get into that. You were a Good volleyball you were a books, coach? Book salesman. Yeah. What were you a volleyball coach? I, in Switzerland. Oh. I have to say something. I was I was Casual. actually, I was in New York last week. Yeah. And there was a man cutting fish. And I, I don't know, I stopped in the street and I said to myself, my dad used to do that. That's right. But what do you, what, how were you a fish cutter? I was such a good fish cutter. I, I and I will go on record saying that I'm serious. Your mother was with me. Am I right? We went to look at a, a home someone had for sale, and a guy was maybe 85 years old. He goes, I know you. You used to cut the best fish oh, at did Dover you? Deli. Am I lying? <laughs> I you believe could, you. You could read through it. I was, for some reason, some reason, me and fish. <laughs> you and fish are <laughs> me and fish. 
Of course, you get complaints, everyone, ah, it's not thick enough. But <laughs> yeah, I would do that. And I just do a lot of these odd jobs because I thought if I do all these horrible jobs at night, it would leave the day open to go out and pursue my alleged career. Mm -hmm. And nothing was happening. So I would take any random job from bodyguards to this, to chasing people, to... Chasing people? Yeah. Well, I, would, you... I chased people out of bookstores. If they robbed. <laughs> if they robbed. Yeah. No, so through things. all of these oddball jobs, odd, jo odd jobs, did you get fired from many of them? Everyone. Okay. Which one were you the best at, though? The fish. I runners? was fantastic at being an usher. Why? Actually, because, I can see that. <laughs> because people go, "Oh, it's an usher." I go, "No, you don't get it. Usher. I can go to class eight hours a day and watch a film, how it's broken down, how it's written, how it's truly." Uh, constructed and deconstructed because I watch it every day and I started taking notes and I became really good at understanding editorial right. uh, and we ended up yeah. winning an Oscar for was best that your, editing. But, and, was that uh, your introduction to that film? That was my introduction to it, yeah. So I thought, okay, let me just take this horrible job, but I know there's a plan there. Mm -hmm. It isn't like, okay, I, I went the four years of college to become an usher. No, I went mm -hmm. the four years of college to eventually do something in the arts right and i thought here it is this is a no-brainer so right. at that point when you were an usher and you're watching the film and you're breaking it down in your head were you wanting to be an actor or were you wanting to be a screenwriter editor director all right the acting was i was starting to realize this is never going to happen people were saying oh you have a speech impediment your mouth is crooked you slur and i go tell me something i don't know <laughs> i know that they said, well, it's just not going to work. You, maybe you'll be an extra. So I started to buy into that and go, hmm. Because every time I was cast, it was always for a thug. Yeah. Can you imagine? I always thought I'd be like Hugh Grant as like a selling oh, book, as oh, a really? love interest. <laughs> yeah. What are you saying no for over there? Mom's, Mom's saying, saying no. no. She, come on, you married me. It had to be something. <laughs> okay. She's something. so shy. She thinks you're funny. I know. She does think I'm funny. She's, <laughs> she's the greatest. Don't show up a heart attack. Oh, yeah. My wife is the shyest person You ever know what born. you've always said to us, though, was that um, no matter what we do in life, always learn how to write. Because regardless of anything, because that, I mean, that's what kind of, I guess. Yeah, you don't even have to be a good writer. Exactly. You just have to write, and and eventually that'll your inner thoughts will come to the surface and take care of themselves. To to be a gifted writer, it, it's it's freakish. Like you can be a really gifted actor mm -hmm. and a terrible writer, terrible right. director. You know, have to know what your niche is. So anyway, acting, I realized I was always going to play the thug. I was always going to be the mugger. I was always beating up Woody Allen or beating up Jack Lemmon or beating up, uh, who's the guy that played, David Carradine. Mm -hmm. Actually, David Carradine beat me up. That's when I realized I said, <laughs> I, enough is enough. I can't, I can't take it anymore. And Death Race 2000. And that's when I started oh, to focus on funny. the written word. And I was never good. I, well, was, wait, how I would you... like to talk about the fact that you just said that you're never good. Because never. people tend to pursue careers or hobbies at things that they know they're good at, or at least they think that they're good at. Mm. But writing is one of those things that either you go to school and you're taught how to do it, or you're just naturally gifted and, and that's something that just pours out of you. Mm. But you're saying, I knew I wasn't a good writer. So what made you continue to write? Because I never passed an English course. In other words, when you say good writer, I'll use that terminology and you understand the inner workings and outer workings of the English language. In mm -hmm. other words, you understand how to deconstruct and construct a sentence, how to diagram a sentence, how to know what a pronoun is, an adjective. Not me. But you don't need to know I that. understand, but you, you do. They in do a sense. teach you that you need to know that. People yeah. will grade you. Like you go to college, you turn in your term paper, and you've turned it in the way I turn it in, they say you're an idiot. But, <laughs> but the difference is, it's the way people speak. Then how did you teach yourself then? I just just an ear. Did you read a lot? Was it like I did. Watching? I did read a lot. I, I didn't read when I was in college, and then I started when I was broke. I would spend hours at the New York Library mm -hmm. just looking for subject matter, or something, and then eventually I came across Edgar, Edgar Allan Poe. Po. I knew it, and I said, "What do I have to do with this guy? Nothing. Zero. A. He's a stone genius. He's a poet laureate. He's an incredible writer. 
And I mean, he would have been the most amazing director. In other words, he, he didn't yeah. have that yeah. visual outlet so is back he, then. is he what changed everything for you? But here's what changed me, folks, is when you start to get something that's out of your wheelhouse, for example, writing about Poe, I was no longer writing about what I did last summer or my adventure or how I got along with my mother. It was about another subject. Mm -hmm. So now I became a writer about another subject. So you right. became an investigator. You became uh, more of your exploring. In other mm -hmm. words, you became a vehicle for writing that's not just about you. Yeah. Like you'll see some things like Woody Allen. He'll do 80% of his material is him. Right. About his life. Mm -hmm. That's what he does. Mm -hmm. And he does it well. Whereas I thought, oh, I'm never going to get out of this until I start writing about someone else's life. And that was the beginning of Poe. And then from Poe, I did a thing called Cheerful Charlie, which is an incredible story about. You've written over 45 screenplays. Yeah, a lot Any of screenplays. Mom told so, us did that. you, going off of what you had just said, was writing outside of your wheelhouse, writing about people and, and stories that weren't about you, was that sort of an escape from your own yeah, reality? Yeah, it was. You know, especially writing female parts. Like when you write Adrian, people go, oh, Rocky. Rocky's not a. If Rocky, if someone says Rocky's a sports film again, I want to. Wait, why does that upset you yeah. so much? Because it's not what a is sports it? film. Clear it up right now. A what sports is Rocky? Film is, what is Rocky is a love story mm -hmm. about a guy who is a broken down fighter. That's all it is. Right. It's never about money. It's never about oh, I became champion. Oh, I want to be champion. No. I just put something together. So you love Edgar Allan Poe, his brain, his love stories, his emotions, and then you always used to tell us you used to look up to Hercules as yeah. a physical sure. being. Do you think that's like a combination of the two with Rocky? Yeah. <laughs> oh my God, it is. Edgar's it is. brain think and, about it. and because Hercules' Her body. Hercules is, he didn't he go from like zero to hero? And then you have Edgar Allan Poe, who's like immensely in love with this, what was it? Um, Penelope, what was her name? Annabelle Lee. Annabelle Lee. Ah, oh. Ha, ha, ha. Maybe I just unlocked something that you didn't even realize. So you're saying because I like Hercules and I like Poe, you've just discovered something? Yeah. Well, I realize that's Rocky. No, but I think you, you might have hit on something. Because you were saying that I think that's what something even that I do, I think even Sistine does, and a lot of people do, is to sometimes see like a better version of themselves. They start to create a different character. And you right. probably saw, I mean, is that how you started Rocky? Did you always love boxing before? No. No? It was so okay. I just saw it as a very, very easy sport to figure out. You think that's <laughs> yeah, it? Yeah, I mean, it's pretty simple. And then you realize how much skill goes into it, which is extraordinary. And it's also add the life and death aspect of yeah. it. But boxing... I realize people are obsessed with two things in life, racing and boxing. In every aspect, oh, you got to race to beat the clock. You got to race to get your thing on time. Race to get your tax return. Race, 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 race. Get your final sign. It's always going somewhere. Yeah. Time is up. And people will bet on how fast this phone falls. This, I mean, anything. Mm -hmm. is Nothing's off limits for, for racing, for time. And I thought, okay, what's the other thing that everyone relates to symbolically? Fighting. As mm -hmm. soon as a guy walks into the room, he sides up another guy. Oh, how would I last against him? Mm -hmm. I mean, everything is a competitive. Mm -hmm. And then it gets down to you realize shit. Life is a big battle, man. There's like there's no flat spots. It's usually you solve one problem, then you got another one. Right. Then you got this job. Then you got a terrible relationship. You got a good relationship, but it falls apart. Well, one thing after another, fighting. So I thought if I could write a story that deal with a guy that deals with a guy who's a schlumpy guy who on the outside looks like a real tough guy should maybe have it together. He has nothing together. Yeah. And, and people can relate to that. Yeah. Because yeah. he doesn't even think of himself as tough. He's just a loser. Well, and he admits he's a loser. There's so much that people can relate to within mm -hmm. the film. And I think that aside from it being a love story, obviously it, it highlights the message of not giving up. Right. And people really resonate with that. And I think a lot of you know fans of yours don't know or maybe they do if they're a true fan, don't know how strong that message is held even before Rocky or while Rocky was being written. Because, for example, your living situation as you were writing Rocky, 
I mean, you said that you would have newspapers on your walls to keep you warm. Like, what were you? Yeah. What was your living <laughs> situation you, as you were writing the first rock? You painted the windows black to focus. Yeah, I did paint them black because I didn't want to know what time it. It didn't matter what time it was. You know, so oh, well, you gotta. Oh, it's time for breakfast. Right away, you just you derailed yourself. Right. Mm -hmm. I'll I'll have breakfast when I'm hungry. I don't need to know what time right. it is. That kind of thing. So I was trying to eliminate all the excuses because it's hard to write. And you're looking for any reason, please, someone call. That's why I took the phone out. So you couldn't be called. <laughs> so you were straight focus, painted straight, black 100%, windows. One hundred percent black windows. And it was a no phone. But that actually makes a lot of sense because even today when you're writing and you go into your zones, and I know mom knows this for fact, you'll wake up at around two in the morning. Yeah. And then you'll go back to bed around seven in the morning. You'll right. isolate. I mean, your schedule is crazy, time. but I didn't know that you would do that's that even style. when you were writing Rocky. And that's really clever. Well, I don't know if it's clever. It just seems to well, be. It, a, that, well, that's it's just his writing style. I think somewhat of a genetic disp uh, dispensation to have this kind of the writing gives it to you. It's kind of like a gift mm -hmm. that it will tell you when to write, when not to write. But writing, I'll tell you right now, is a miserable means of existence it is terrible is there anything you like about no writing? there's nothing, nothing. I, there's, okay you love you love the end result you love the fact that you have it on paper i respect writing unbelievable but the process itself and i've discussed this with so many writers look at writers mm -hmm. they look it's true ready to right. kill themselves yeah it's they're a all lot. worn out they're tired they live in their own heads Psych psychologically they're torn to shreds because they can never be in the moment they can never be in this right now if i was writing a screenplay i'd be going I'm working. oh yeah hi hello and I, but i'm still oh my going God. i gotta finish that thing so mm. you're torn like that and that's why a lot of uh alcoholics i mean uh, uh, writers become alcoholics right right they do. Well, I'm sure not knowing what time it was for you definitely spun you out in a bad way. And <laughs> but obviously it worked out because how you wrote the screenplay I, in what, I, three days? Yeah. Four days? Three yeah, days? Three no, days. no. It, I thought it was a it was a four days? Three and a half days. Three and a half oh, days. Oh, I thought it was a week. No, because again, I tell young people that want to be writers, don't get so hung up on the perfection. Know that 90% of it is garbage. Mm. The fact that you got through, that's amazing. That you actually got a beginning, middle, and end, no matter how flawed, that's the hard part. Because 90% of the writers, they go up to about page 80 and they burn out. Mm -hmm. Page 90, burn out. They don't have that finale. If you happen to have an ending, man, you're home free. How did you feel going from being literally a kid kicked out of 13 schools, selling your dog, all the stuff, having barely any money to scrape by to instant stardom? It's it's kind of shocking because therein lies a terrible attribute that people actually it's a fl character flaw, it's not an attribute where you tend to seek out revenge. I told you so. I told you so. Right. I told you so. So now you become a bit more belligerent. I warned you. This and that, and it's like a fighter after having won a victory, you're standing over your opponent like this. You know, you don't need to do that. Mm -hmm. You right. won. You knocked out. You proved your point. That's that to me was my biggest problem, mm -hmm. and it took years to work that out because right. you open your mouth up and you burn a few bridges, and that were was you, foolish. Were you applying that "I told you so" towards agencies, movie studios, or was it just the world in general? Mostly critics. Critics. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mostly critics who say you couldn't do it, this and that, or there's certain ways that you come into this business. And I came in a very obtuse way, so I wasn't exactly everyone's favorite. Mm -hmm. I'm like an anomaly. So I didn't work my way up, in other words. Some actors say, oh, De Niro did this, and Pacino went to that clay, and he, yeah, they worked their way up. They earned it. Right. And so they said you didn't earn it. Well, they say, I just put it this way who is this guy? You know what I mean? Like, where did he come from? What are his credentials? He's okay, I guess, for an amateur. That kind oh. of a thing. It's no, it's all right. I, I get it. I get it. It's no, no big deal. That's what sells papers. But the point is, you're supposed to, hopefully, just let it go. Because mm -hmm. you've got the, you won. You got the prize. Mm -hmm. 
if you sit there and flaunt it, that's what's really horrible. And that's what like a lot of guys make that. And I see it happening and I go, oh man, I want to give this guy a call and say, just take your win and leave. Mm -hmm. Don't sit there and grind and make this critic's a fool and that critic's a fool. And it's not true. It's just, that's not how the business works. Listen, you've had critics since they were doing plays of Antigone back in, you know, ancient Greece. It's yeah. always been that way. But I don't know if you learned that lesson until later on in life. I this probably haven't. I'm probably just talking crap. I haven't no, no, learned no, it at all. You, I, I think what exactly what you're saying right now, I think you do right now, 100%. But were you that way when you were by the Rocky Four comes along? You're already known, you're already famous, but are you still having that sort of attitude of saying, Yeah, I think yeah, so. that's what I'm saying. So when did you realize, at what age did this realization come? I think from? when you almost lose it. I had a real down period, say around 95, when I did Copland, 95, 96. And I said, oh, let me do something really off, <laughs> you know, off my, out of my comfort zone. And I did it, and it, I was very happy with the project, but actually it set me way back. Why? It just, it, the studios are going, why would you do that, man? You did that for nothing. Why would why would you just do an action film? I said because I was going to do it. I was going to do an action film next. I was just trying to prove a point to myself and whoever cared. He go, well, that doesn't make us look good because you're doing this for free, and why would we pay you? And mm -hmm. anyway, it it began a real bad spiral for about eight years. And eight years. Did you write anything in between that? No. I mean, I couldn't imagine as a very successful actor not working. What does totally. that do to an actor's ego? Well, Jennifer, do you want to answer this? Ask my one? wife about that. What do you What do you think, Mom? Well, I'm not probably can't hear me, but it was it was um, we had Sophia and then we had you, Sistine. So I just stayed being a mom. She stayed I busy. Like, I stayed neurotic. He stayed neurotic. We just kind of left him in the movie theater watching films all day. <laughs> so For years and years and years and years, I said, you know, I'm going to try to make one last Rocky. And nobody wanted to do it. The producer said, over my dead body, it's never going to happen. It was really, it's a real wake-up call. Yeah. Yeah. No one, no one wanted to do it. And we happened to be in a restaurant one night, and we met a fellow who, his name was Joe. And you know, we should admit, right? Yeah, Joe. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I don't want to get him in trouble or anything. Yeah. So... He goes, yeah, it's a great idea. It sounds like a good story. Bring it on over. So I brought over because my wife knew him. He goes, the screenplay, my wife read it and she cried. I went, yeah, Wait, now you, we're there. Now we're mom in. Mom brought you back from the dead of 60. Yeah, she's cheering because she knows she did. She, Hold on. So, so take, Jennifer was the Jennifer, one that created Rocky Balboa. Well, she started the introduction which therefore created but the didn't, last but mom sent the script over to the wife okay, right mom well, i sent the script to joe <gasps> don't Ooh, you i did look you at didn't this. do any, you didn't do anything ah ah but you, okay mama so Fine. i'm now every strong man is a stronger woman that's all right, right. i'll give her credit with <laughs> i have a question what was the worst film you've done and what was your favorite film to do Worst film. Rhinestones. Mm. Just kidding. That was my favorite. You and Stop Dolly or my Parton. mom will I, show I, on. Let, no, listen. I had fun on that movie. You in 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 Chaps with Dolly Parton. That was are you the kidding best. me? That's your peak. That was. I feel like so that much. is actually who you are. People you need guys to think, bring that back. No, I think that's people closer think, to who I that's am. That's what I'm saying. People yeah. think he's more Rambo. You're way more Rhinestone. Yeah, that's way more. Or Oscar when you tried to do comedy. Oh one. my God, Oscar is funny. You're yeah. you're a funny guy in life. I don't know if comedy is your thing. Well, there's another thing. I think yeah. you build a certain kind of image. Yeah. And like if Clint Eastwood came in here right now and did one of the great comedy routines. No. Just look at no. it. See, so already going, I don't know. No. I'd be afraid to laugh because he may shoot me. But that's, what <laughs> that's the point. But I feel like that's what people feel like with that you. They but do. They, see, they like, do. Oh. They do. So I have to realize, God, you're not exactly the comedic type looking. You just don't yeah. fit that thing. So therein lies the issue. Right. Yeah. So, but it took a few comedies to figure that out. And even though I love comedies, it was a disaster. Wow. You're also a savant. Honestly, this guy knows everything about everything. He'd probably tell you where this couch was built. I know where that couch is built. 
Yeah. Right outside of Italy, there was no, a couple of a buck tooth brothers who make no, these but you know it's crazy. Called the buck toothos. He may not know how to fix. My mom is probably the one that will know how to fix like the pool heater or whatever. But you'll know where what year Michelangelo did a painting or. I would say mom is more the hands on deck and then dad's more of the... Uh, the yeah, <laughs> sporadic intelligence. It helps. You know, I mean, uh, bathroom reading. You'd be surprised. After a while, you're an bathroom? encyclopedia. Yeah, you know, he, does have have like, he does have like 16 books next to his toilet. Right. Have you, you ever there? seen it? He has like... Oh, like he takes so long in the bathroom. You have a library card. You go into my bathroom. He literally has like stacks card. of books next to in his That's bathroom. That's so funny. That's why you spend so much time in the Well, maybe I use it for toilet paper. Did you ever think of that? Ew. Okay. You know what? I honestly think that if Rocky was never written, and imagine your life then, right? I think you'd be a stand-up comedian. I don't. Because, what? listen, you push the envelope. He does. He says things that are inappropriate, but funny, and people relate I've to been them. On, I've been on good behavior today. You know? I know you have. I know. But don't this you think is that, really that good could behavior. be something? You'd be good at that, for sure. I know, but I think there's so many better people at it. That no. Really, I mean, yes. I mean, yes. I mean, this, first of all, to be a great comedian... It's it's a lot of work and it's a lot of darkness. Yeah, and it's a lot of spending your time home feeling miserable. Wait, and then you got to like turn that into somehow a comedy years. routine. You did that for eight years. You've I, had I know. I get it. I enjoy it. Okay, I enjoy it. But you just can't turn around and change something that's been around for fifty years. Yeah, like all of a sudden we're now changing this mayonnaise, and this will be <laughs> fruit gums. Oh. Wait a minute, it's mayonnaise. No, it's fruit gums from now on. You're just not going to all of a right. sudden switch and something I, so yeah. drastic like that. But, you know, that's, I think, where, if you guys are wondering why we have a show called Unwaxed, a lot of our personality and I think our sense of humor does come from you. We have a very raw, dry Unwaxed. sense of humor, and that's probably why we're still extremely single is because no one can take us seriously. Also, you do scare them, but... At the same time, I think that love and happiness is overrated, girls. It love is. And happiness oh, so is what do we expect? Huh. Yeah, I want you to have misery and, okay. and, and solitude. Know, it's so funny though, because when you when we were growing up, you would always tell us as young girls that we weren't allowed to get married until no. we were forty five. I think that's and I honestly to be believed true. that. Yeah. Until I was about, I still believe 16. it. Yeah. What is wrong with it? I think it's a great idea. Still. Yeah. W why? What's the rush? I get no rush, but 45. Well, I'll tell you why. Because at one time, 45 was your life expectancy. And you've already had about 11 kids <gasps> at 45. Like in the War of 1812? What no, do you I'm mean? Sure that's pretty much it. Oh, okay. 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 But how was it being in a household full of girls? Because now you are with literally even all girl dogs except Buster, our one dog. Like, What's it like? How is it like? How is it with all girls in the house? Oh, God. It's like being in a Cuisinart <laughs> head first. Just lowered into like when you when you're trying to break down ice cubes. Okay, but there must be it's something just that you noise like it makes. It. Is there anything you like? Yeah, come on. About you guys? No, yeah, no I guess. girls in the household. Yeah, okay. yeah, I guess. Anything or am I? Am I no, guess? I love you my like girls. Listen, listen, I love my girls. <laughs> they're they're her. almost almost trouble free. They've almost. been nothing but a pleasure. They inherit, luckily, from their mother their morality and their sense of humor. I guess you might say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But no I think one. I think what's funny and a lot of people don't know is although you have three daughters, it's always, th you know, I guess with mom, it's always four against one. You raised us like macho men. men. Yeah. yeah, you did. And mm -hmm. it's so interesting. Whenever I tell the story to people, they truly don't believe me. So I guess it might be better coming from you. But when we were in middle school from maybe second grade to high school, yeah, you would wake us up every day at 6 a.m. For mm -hmm. sure. We'd have to go downstairs, push ups, sit ups, clean throw and jerk, shot, clean jerk, deadlift, throw a shot put. You're in the army put. now. No, but we Wait, guys, 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 we every had day. a little four pack when we were in middle school. And I wish I was kidding. Like, I the think four pack. But <laughs> genuinely, look at our like photos when we were wearing bathing suits. We had abs because yeah. of. But so the why, way you raised it. But why did you also and, and not only, ketchup and eggs? Oh, he God. Made us and not only morning. that, not only that, you made us recite poetry every single day yeah, yeah. into a tape recorder yeah. every single day and that yeah. was the thing is what i liked about the way you raised us was none of my girlfriends could possibly relate to it because their dad would do normal dad stuff whereas like what what is normal just dad stuff? normal 
whole di- like, like let me what? cut your peanut butter and jelly into four oh slices. Oh my god. Whereas you That's it? No, I'm How saying How about some flapjacks, girl? <laughs> That's really no, what I'm saying. What I can tell them is that they cannot relate to it all is did your dad make you speak uh into a tape recorder and recite poetry and yeah. lyrics? Now we know the raven by day. heart. But what but is why? that other one that you know that was so great? Anyway, I wanted them to articulate and hit these words known as plosive sounds, like, and so you put a piece of, uh, I don't know, so you, you don't even have it here. Oh, yeah. Yes. He would put a, no, uh, a would, tissue. If you have a napkin or a tissue, you go, pa, pa, and it, it would pop up. It if was not, a competition to see how high it was. Every day, he would tape a napkin to our forehead. So she had this napkin taped to her nose, and, <laughs> and they learned to be so loud. Loud, yeah. And very dramatic. Yeah. It was so nice. So what was going through your, so with the workouts in the morning. Because I wanted someone to do it for me. And I said, okay, okay. I would like this. I, I would like this. That. For yeah. sure. Who wouldn't want that? And we that? weren't allowed to do any other field sports except shot put. Now, I wanted you girls to do something that you would be called upon never to do. Oh, yeah. But when you do, you would be ready. Hold on. Yeah, like, no, but I got, a shot no, put do you was remember amazing. what happened? I got second place in shot put. There you and go. And you stormed off, and you were so mad you didn't talk to me. But you know, two what? days. But you know because what? Because we did trained to me. for months. You know what? True. But guess what? I broke the record at school. So you it did worked. actually. She. Break. They were. There was eight events, and you won seven of them. And they pulled you out of the eighth one. No, we were because, definitely raised as full-on tomboys. Well, I just thought it'd be interesting to take them and put you into sports that normally aren't akin to women. Yeah. Like. Traveling, I loved discus, it. and shot put, boxing, power lifting. But you know what was funny is that you were so into us doing sports and anything physical activity that any time it was involving school, mom was out of town and she was working, you wouldn't drive us to school for that week. Yeah. I, this was, by the way, one of my favorite memories with you. By far. Mom was always on the road working. Right. And whenever she would leave, you actually taught me what hooky was in the fourth hooky, grade. Hooky, is it? And I said, what's hooky? I remember we were driving past my school, and the top was down. It was raining, mm-hmm. and you didn't care. The rain was coming into the car. Yeah. I had my school uniform on. The gates were closed because we were about four really? hours late to school. And we just kept driving. I said, the school's right here. And you go, no, do you know what hooky is? And I said, no. And he goes, we're about to go on the best adventure of your life. <laughs> and so every time mom would go out of town, I'd be like, it's time for hooky. And it we is. would just explore and have so much I'm fun. a big believer that you can learn more out there than you can sometimes in a classroom. So I learned whatever I learned while I'm here but is I learned it, out there. Isn't it so fascinating what a kid will remember? Like that it is. Yeah. That is amazing. Because yeah, well, I would have thought you would have ratted me out. And said, no, I'm no, trying no, to no, be no. good too. I just remembered something that was horrible that you used to do. Do you remember for four years we believed that he was on American Idol? That was rude. I told kids in my class. I told yeah, everybody really? in my class. You were so, it was, we were watching oh, American Idol. On. And you were like, you were I so was, mean. do you remember this mom? We came into the room, I think we're in fifth grade, and we were watching it, and you were like, yeah, you know, I was on it. We go, no. And he goes, yeah, 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 no. They didn't want me to continue because I was too good. And we, like, yeah, guys, that's true. you, I, you that's idolize true. your dad. Like you, you're, we're daddy's we girls. You were the greatest guy. Ever. We told for f- literally four years, we believed that they just didn't air it. I don't know why we didn't question that. And then all of a sudden, you like you came up to us and we brought it up to someone, and you were like, you actually believed that. And yeah, so, yeah, it was sad. No, but I knew it wasn't true when one girl came up to me and said, "You're a liar." And I was in second grade. I go, "No, my dad doesn't lie to me." That's right. Yeah, you did. No, yeah, I did. you did. You have big time lied. But it's okay. Well, she's a liar there, girl. Yeah, she's don't, such a liar. Don't ever oh, yeah. her. But you were, you were really... Go find her if, and tell her. If opposite day was a person, that's you. I mean, mm-hmm. it was ice cream for breakfast, pancakes for dinner. Well, you know, it sounds like like the beginning of a good movie here. Like, <laughs> right. Daddy, what's, what's yeah. What's happening at the end? Daddy's day off here. <laughs> I never... Think, I, it's so funny because every time I think about even when it comes to like marriage or proposal, I don't think you're going to be the dad that's going to sit there going, a guy like asking for your hand in marriage. I cannot oh see God. you sitting there seriously going, yes, sir, no, you this can is do what it. dad or, would do. He'd put out his hand and you'd pull his finger and make a fart joke. Like, yeah, that's literally. That's what you would do. <laughs> that's what you would do. I got to see where he's... Like, how is he going to handle stress? Oh God! Oh. Things like no, seriously, girls. These guys will come on. They'll say everything. Like they'll they'll be the most perfect individual on the planet until Uh-oh. that day when you because you really don't know anyone until you've gotten into a serious 
argument. See, then you so, understand what a person is made of. Are they forgiving? Are they not? Are they uh, explosive? Are they gentle? Yeah. Oh, would you learn a lot? I actually am learning a lot from you because you are, I would say, more involved in my dating life than most fathers yes, I or am. Their daughters. Or people, our guys, like the guys that we date, realize. Uh, no, they don't realize that every time I break up with them, it's actually Sly breaking up with them, yeah. not me. Like, none of it is my words whatsoever. He's They're written horrible. every breakup text. I don't feel sorry about one of them. Uh, by the way, and they always give a great response. I do have to say, for some reason, you are a savant when it comes to dating for millennials. It's actually amazing. <laughs> you really are. He really I know knows. how to get rid of guys. No, no. You know how to get rid of guys, but you also know how to like us to trick them into falling in love with us, too. You're like, well, I can tell that you exactly. that you're not supposed to do. That's Why? You. Why can't you Why? do that? Because I, you, I don't think you should lead people on it. If you're not into it, then don't be into it. You it's know, true. Just, you are very... One thing you are really instilled in us is safety, and so yeah. you really don't, do. Don't lead the people worst. on because that's when people snap. Yeah, and you don't want that. I have a question. What do you think of the guys that we've dated? Losers. Dad, come on, be your... real. Dad, not... Mom's shaking her head, going, "Come on." They're nice. I'm guys. only kidding, guys. I'm just doing this for the benefit of the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's really. funny though no they, they've been very nice guys they really have and um, <laughs> you know like, i do not this believe, it all. Yeah. Yeah. believe what, it what? mom's <laughs> giving him the death glare to just say this they are nice guys right <laughs> yeah. mom loves them she sits at 2 a.m we do mom misses they are. all of them so do you the first i i love his story because this i think is like the first true experience i've ever had i was the first to have a boyfriend or anything and i think that when you're the guinea pig, you never really know what to expect and you bring a boyfriend home. And this is in high school. And I brought my high school boyfriend over for the first time meeting right. the parents. And do you remember what you did to him when he sh you shook his hand? Yeah. Yeah? Sort of. It was tight. You, you were tight. You gripped it. Yeah. And after you said... Next time, shake my hand like a man. Oh, well, I was a little carried away, but yes. <laughs> Dad, he was 17. <laughs> he was tall for his age, though. No, he wasn't. He was yes, short. He was. He was short. <laughs> and, and, he never, and he never he was forgot that. Five he never forgot. No. No? Dude, Can I, he doesn't I'll even tell remember you which one. No, I'll tell you this. Every time, <laughs> every time we bring a guy over, I tell them before they go through the front door, please just grip my dad's hand hard because yeah. for some reason he'll test you right there and like that'll That's tell true. everything. Listen, I'm I'm only joking. Your boyfriends no. You scared they're, the shit out of them. No, but you wow. know what? Actually, that's not true. These guys are big guys. That's not true. Like it's how about this? Six foot so I, five I have a good story. Player. I have a good story. What? I was getting dropped off for a date one time, right? Yeah. It's my third date. I don't know. Maybe I was 19. I was hoping for perhaps a kiss at the end of the night. And oh, relax. From him? Yeah, well, what? From, from the, who? From the bush? Not from me. What do you mean? Like, and I look up. No, he looks up. <laughs> We're outside our house. You're listen, so listen to the story. What? You're ruining my story. You just jump out and go. <laughs> <laughs> you thought I was going to do that? No. Are you Gross. Are you even oh, listening to what she's saying? Listen. Sort of. We didn't expect listen. you to kiss him. All right. I'm going to start over. Okay. He pulls up our driveway. Ah. Right? Perhaps the date and myself might kiss. Oh. He looks up and goes, holy shit, is that your dad? And he looks up on the balcony oh, yeah? on the second floor. The lights are pitch black, except you have one light in your bathroom coming back behind lit. you. So it's just a black silhouette of you standing, looking over down. <laughs> and he got in his car. <laughs> and I, that was the last time I saw him. He never came back. He never called me back after that. Come on. And I always Wait. say, I always call him, that was the one that got away. Dude, you actually, wow. I always say, you literally turn into yeah. King Shark. You say one word to these guys, you go, Mm. No, he didn't have to say okay. anything. You're like the Grim Reaper over there in the no. corner. Good thing. Who do you think is harder to satisfy, me or Sophia? You. I mean, yes! no, no, oh, no. Sophia! No, you, no! you, you, <laughs> you. Yes. Time. What would you say? Sophia. Yeah. Jennifer, yes! thank you. Mother said. Sophia, that's obvious. Okay, I don't think it's bad to have high standards. Okay, now it's high standards. It was <laughs> difficult. Now it's high standards. It was picky. It was height. No, it's high. I'm standard. not hard to date. Complex. I just picky. Yeah. No. It's... Oh, well. Okay. Okay. You and mom have been together, I mean, married for 25 years, but been together for 30 35. Yeah. Two, three, yeah. What do you think is like the secret to keeping oh, that long of a relationship? She's the greatest. Aww. She is. She smiles a lot. 
<laughs> she can't help it though. She keeps covering her teeth, and it doesn't help because her teeth are longer than her, her, teeth. her teeth are longer than her fingers. So Why that's are, so like sticks out like that. So it's like an elephant trying to cover no, his tusks. See, like that's the thing. It's like you constantly roast her. You roast, you know, you roast her. You're like, oh, I love her, but her teeth and are she's just too nice to come roast in my little back. piano, like. <laughs> Dad. No. So what is this? She what, just, what do you she, think it is? That I, I don't know. I just enjoy her company. I just she's so fun in a in a naive way because she actually means what she's saying. Yeah, that's what I think is so funny. You always say this. You always say that mom is the only person that you've had in your entire life that you can hang out with every single day. You're like the only person I don't get annoyed with after. That's true. Right? No, <laughs> she doesn't so. tell you this part. She hides. <laughs> I can't find her. If I'm in a house, <laughs> I'm in a house. I cannot find her for 12 hours. Actually, watching your guys' relationship did, I would say, for both Sistine and I, show that you guys are very, very fun with each other, no matter what. You I have a lot fun more fun. Other. I have a lot more fun with her than she has with me. I think, no. She, I, I think mom's a little fiery sometimes. Really? Yeah. Oh, she, yeah. Really? Oh, yeah. <laughs> mom's got a sharp tongue. Did you say fiery? What? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I thought I don't. I don't see as fiery. I see it's funny. Mom, she needs a hearing aid. <laughs> there she goes. There's that tongue. I, eh? <laughs> Those horns, like the ear horns. trumpet, like eh? You know, like bassoon. See, I that's the thing. We call mom the town crier. She is. Yeah. She is a nice word for being a big mouth. Yes, it is. And what does She'll that tell make everything. you? Everything. What? She's a big mouth. What are you? I wouldn't say I'm a big mouth. No, if she's the big mouth, what are you? I don't know, baby. I'm kind of Mr. like the, I'm the insulter. It's all about me. What, see, it's all about me. You guys, that's your that's we your fallback position. It's all about me. Yeah, God, you know, the worst thing he's ever done was get an Instagram account. It's made him even worse. It's like no, actually, time. I enjoy it. Thank you. No, I honestly think Instagram is good for you. You're connecting with your younger generation. I'm going on TikTok next. No, next oh yeah. my God. For oh. sure. That's it. My now Lord. you've done it. Now you've thrown down the gauntlet. Dad, that is officially the most embarrassing thing you can yeah, do. Yeah, I really I want you, you to go hear on TikTok. We're going TikToking. TikToking? I've never heard. TikToking? We're TikToking. No, don't encourage this, you yeah, guys. Yeah, please, guys, please. Dun, no, this, this, dun, you guys dun, are the problem, dun, all right? Dun, You're giving dun, him the ego. Dun, By the way, dun, it would mean, but actually, I don't even think he'll know how to use TikTok. I'm not teaching you anything. I'm not teaching you I don't you need your help anymore. I'm beyond you guys. I'm going to keep posting videos of you I can get a TikTok filters. coach. Easy. A TikTok like coach? A TikTok coach. The first TikTok. I can't. Okay. You all know right. what? Jennifer, right? No. 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 Next time he's going to see you said no, that's it. Oh, that's... Ooh. <laughs> she got you. Well, that rule is your sorry butt out. No. Oh, my God. No, but it, it's fun. I, I actually do love all of our dating stories. Dad, this was something we've been looking forward to for the last 50 episodes. And I'm really, wow. really thankful that you came on and did this. This is like a really big... Uh, you were pretty well behaved. Yeah. I, I was. have to say. It was not easy. It was not easy. I could tell you're squirming and you're no, ready. <laughs> you're ready. But thank you guys so much for tuning into our 50th episode of the Unwax podcast. Make sure you're subscribed. Get ready to follow along on our Instagram, our YouTube page. What else are we on? Where can they find you? Oh. <laughs> My Instagram. Did you just say that? Did you just say As that? As a joke. I'm being sarcastic. I'm under At official slide Stallone on Instagram. <laughs> you see what? That he's under hashtag Schwarzenegger. True. <laughs> okay, cool. But thank you guys for tuning in, and we will see you next week. Say bye, Dad. Bye, Dad. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs>